Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala seyyidina Muhammed il vasfi ve vahve ve risaleti ve hikmeti ve ala ali ve sahbi ve sellem teslim. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve barakatuhu. It's well documented that the Quran uh, contains information that was not known uh, at the time of the revelation of the Quran. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam could not have known this information. One well-known example, uh, well documented by many people, is the distinction that the Quran makes between the titles of the ruler at the time of Prophet Joseph and the ruler at the time uh, of the Pharaoh that uh, Prophet Moses confronted. The, the ruler at the time of Egypt, at the time of Prophet Joseph, is referred to as king, whereas uh, the ruler at the time uh, of Prophet Moses is referred to as Pharaoh. We know now that the reason for this distinction is that Prophet Joseph lived under uh, the uh, rule of the Hyksos kings, uh, and uh, these were not Egyptians and were not called pharaohs. Whereas uh, Moses, of course, went to an Egyptian pharaoh. This information um, became uh, um, known only uh, in the late 19th century uh, and early 20th century when the uh, excavation uh, of ancient Egypt uh, started. So um, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, could not have known that. Uh, what's interesting as well is that the Bible does not make this distinction. Uh, it has, um, it, it basically uses the term king and pharaoh uh, uh, interchangeably and applies both terms to both the ruler at the time of Prophet Joseph and the ruler at the time of uh, Prophet Moses. Uh, the, what I'm going to talk about today is another uh, historical miracle in the Quran and this is also related to the stories uh, of uh, Prophet Joseph and Prophet Moses. More specifically it's actually from the story uh, mainly from the story of uh, Prophet Moses. The Quran tells us that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned uh, Prophet Moses and spoke to him he tasks, tasked him um, with uh, going to Pharaoh in Egypt and telling him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him to let the Israelites leave Egypt with Prophet Moses. Uh, when the Prophet Moses spoke to Pharaoh about that, uh, Pharaoh scoffed at him, ridiculed him, and did not believe that he was sent by uh, Rabb al-Alameen, the Lord of all peoples. He didn't, of course, believe uh, in, in, in Allah. Uh, so, and he refused uh, to let the Israelites um, uh, leave with him. Of course, when uh, Moses uh, was, was first commissioned to go there, he knew how daunting this task would be. So he asked for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to allow uh, his brother Aaron, Prophet Aaron, uh, to go with him. So they went to uh, Pharaoh together. Now, the, when, when Moses demanded that Pharaoh let the Israelites leave Egypt with him, the Quran reports a very strange reply or claim uh, by Pharaoh to that demand because Pharaoh and his courtiers claimed that Moses actually wanted to expel the Egyptians from their own land. Now, this is a quite puzzling uh, because there is actually no clear connection. It's quite obscure why the demand, Moses' demand, to let the Israelites leave Egypt with him uh, would be seen by Pharaoh and his court as an attempt to expel them from Egypt. Now, this claim is actually repeated four times in the Quran. Every time 
the demand, uh, Moses' demand, to let the Pharaoh, uh, you know, the demand to Pharaoh to let the Israelites leave Egypt with him. Every time this is mentioned in the Quran, uh, Pharaoh's claim uh, that uh, Moses was trying to um, expel the Pharaoh, uh, the Egyptians from their land, is repeated. Um, so you find that in verse um, in Surah 26, chapter 26, verse 36, and also in chapter uh, 7, verse 110. And it also, uh, it's mentioned twice in chapter 20, chapter called Taha. And um, the text goes as follows, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. فَأَتِيَاهُ فَقُولَا إِنَّا رَسُولَا رَبِّكْ فَأَرْسِلْ مَعْنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ وَلَا تُعَذِّبْهُمْ قَدْ جِئْنَاكَ بِآيَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكْ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الْهُدَى Then uh, the text continues وَلَقَدْ أَرَيْنَاهُ آيَاتِنَا كُلَّهَا فَكَذَّبَ وَأَبَا قَالَ أَجِئْتَنَا لِتُخْرِجَنَا مِنْ أَرْضِنَا بِسَحْرِكَ يَا مُوسَى Then the text continues قَالُوا إِنَّ إِنْ هَذَانِ لَسَحْرَانِ يُرِيدَانِ أَنْ يُخْرِجَاكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِكُمْ بِسَحْرِهِمَا وَيَذْهَبَا بِطَرِيقَتِكُمْ الْمُثْلَةِ This is the translation. So go to him and say, We are messengers of your Lord, so send with us the children of Israel and do not torment them. We have come to you with a sign from your Lord, and peace be upon he who follows the guidance. Uh, this is verse number 47. Uh, and then the text goes on and then we come to verse 56 and we uh, read we showed him all our signs but he denied and refused he said have you come to us to drive us out of our land with your magic or Moses and then this is uh, verse 57 and then uh, another uh, repetition of this claim occurs later on in the same surah in verse number 63 they said these are two magicians, magicians who want to drive you out of your land with their magic and do away with your most exemplary way. So what we see here, every time uh, the Moses demand of Pharaoh to let the Israelites leave Egypt, the claim, the counterintuitive claim, this kind of strange claim by Pharaoh and his court that this was an attempt to drive them, drive them out of Egypt is repeated. Interestingly, we don't find this uh, in the in the Bible. This particular claim is it mentioned? We're only told that um, when Moses uh, demanded the release of, of, of the Israelites uh, to be allowed to leave Egypt, uh, Pharaoh objected, saying that, "Oh, you're only trying to." stop them from doing their work because they were slaves. So this is already a really strange um, claim by uh, Pharaoh and his court reported in the Quran. But this is even becomes even more baffling when we uh, remember that Pharaoh, after the, the um, uh, Israelites left with Egypt, so they escaped from Egypt, uh, and he decided to uh, chase them with his army. He described those escapees as shirdimatun qalilun, which means small disorganized remnants, group, small group. Now, the claim was that the Israelites or the Moses was trying to drive um, or expel Pharaoh and his court from Egypt is already strange. But then, the fact that those Israelites were a small group makes this, even, this claim even bizarre and really difficult to explain. Um, obviously, um, exegetes, Muslim exegetes tried to explain, interpret what that exactly meant. And they found it difficult, um, and I'll explain why. But let me give four examples uh, from four uh, well-known uh, exegetical works. Let's start with the third century um, Tabari. So Tabari um, comments 
on this particular claim by Pharaoh. He says that uh, the Egyptians considered the Israelites, the Israelite slaves, as part of them, as a people. Um, uh, so, as a result, they saw the attempt uh, to uh, take the Israelites out of Egypt as a way of driving them out of their land. Now, this uh, interpretation is actually quite weak for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is the fact that the Quran, in the Quran, the uh, the Israelites uh, and the Egyptians are kind of uh, referred to in, 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 in a distinct way. They are never seen as one people from the, the perspective uh, of Moses or Pharaoh. Uh, the whole story talks about them actually as two distinct different people. One of them, the Israelites, are obviously uh, enslaved uh, by the Egyptians. So that, that kind of uh, explanation isn't really um, convincing. The other thing is that if actually um, part of the court, uh, the, or, or, or if, um, if, if um, the Pharaoh considered the Israelites as part of his people, uh, well, why, did we then, why would he consider the, the demand to take them out as a, 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 an act of expulsion? Expul expulsion. This just doesn't doesn't actually kind of make sense. Um, moving on to uh, another uh, uh, very competent um, exegete of the Quran, uh, which is Fakhreddin al-Razi, who lived in the sixth century. He wrote one of the most encyclopedic and detailed uh, exegesis of the Quran. His work is fantastic. Um, it, the, the Fakhreddin al-Razi, um, even though wrote a very detailed um, interpretation of the Quran, commentary on the Quran, actually mentions, makes one passing remark uh, on Pharaoh's demand. And what he says, um, he says that the, um, the, the uh, Pharaoh accused Moses uh, of creating, creating enmity, spreading enmity between the Egyptians, and that would then divide them uh, and then lead effectively to them being expelled. It's really not clear how is this kind of, how this um, uh, kind of view explains the claim, because first of all, there, there are no details of how Moses was, whatever he was doing, was kind of spreading enmity between the Egyptians, N nor, how, nor how this kind of enmity would ultimately leave, uh, lead to uh, dr driving the uh, Egyptians out of their land. Not clear at all. Then in the 8th century, we have Ibn Kathir, the famous um, interpretation of Ibn, Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir's view is that um, because of uh, the Pharaoh accused Moses of having magical powers, and those magical powers would ultimately lead uh, Moses to have more followers than Pharaoh. So the, uh, his followers would then exceed uh, the number of, um, you know, the army that uh, Pharaoh had uh, and would result effectively in them being expelled. Effectively, he's talking about a revolution from within, uh, kind of inside Egypt. Uh, and Ibn Kathir uh, reiterates this view four times. And the four times uh, that the Quran mentions Pharaoh's claim, Ibn Kathir uh, reiterates his, his interpretation. But then again, there are clear weaknesses in this, in this view. First of all, it's not clear why would the Egyptians accept Moses uh, as a leader. I mean, he wasn't Egypt, Egyptian himself. Um, the Egyptians saw the Israelites as slaves. And then one of those slaves, if you like, or a leader of those slaves, would be kind of welcome as as a new 
ruler over um, their Egyptian ruler. That's, that's just not convincing. The Egyptians actually had a lot of resentment uh, for the rule of um, foreign foreigners over their land as they had for the uh, Hyksos. We'll get to that um, later in, in more detail. Also, even if um, the, they kind of took what was happening as an attempt that would ultimately lead to Moses having more followers than uh, Pharaoh, um, why would they explain this or kind of um, claim that this would result in them being expelled as opposed to being killed? Uh, just not, not really clear. Uh, and then uh, we can look as well at the uh, commentary of Ibn Ashur. Ibn Ashur is uh, uh, a 20th century uh, exegete, an, an excellent, outstanding scholar. Uh, Rahimahullah died in 1973, I think. And he reiterates some of the suggestions of um, earlier um, uh, exegetes. But he also um, contributes uh, new views, uh, kind of new explanations uh, of Pharaoh's claim. One of them is that um, he suggested that uh, Pharaoh's court did include Israelites. So um, some of the courtiers there were Israelites. So um, that would mean that uh, taking the Israelites out of Egypt would mean taking out uh, some of those people in, in Pharaoh's court. But that kind of makes Pharaoh's claim that Moses was trying to expel the, um, or take, you know, drive the Egyptians out of their land, kind of, again, difficult to understand. Um, because, uh, first of all, it, it's going to be like kind of some kind of repetition um, of uh, what Moses demanded rather than um, kind of an explanation and, and also um, Moses was talking about actually not taking anybody by force he was talking about um, you know Pharaoh allowing the Israelites to go with them so the concept of expulsion um, it, it doesn't really um, appear in the in the claim um, and then Ibn Ashur uh, suggested uh, another explanation and he said Moses, uh, Pharaoh thought that Moses wasn't going to simply take the Israelites out of Egypt um, and that's that, but he thought that, uh, that Moses was thinking of establishing a new kingdom uh, by taking all believers, not only uh, the Israelites, all believers, out of Egypt and effectively uh, establishing a new kingdom. Um, now, uh, I presume Ibn Ashur suggested all believers because he knew that the Quran describes the Israelites as a small group. So for a new kingdom to be established, a lot more people would be needed. So which is why he thought that um, Pharaoh meant that uh, Moses was to, going to take out uh, all believers. Um, it's not, again, it's not clear why kind of Moses, uh, Moses' claim demand, sorry, Moses' demand would kind of result in, 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 in this suggestion or this idea that he was going to take um, uh, the Israelites out with believers, all other believers, uh, and, and establish a new kingdom. Obviously for Moses, um, for, for kind of um, this suggestion to be any different from just simply taking all the Israelites out, we have to presume that uh, Ibn Ashur was talking about Egyptians believing in Moses. Is that realistic? Well, we have no evidence that actually this happened. If it happened, maybe in small, very tiny numbers, wouldn't have made the size of the population he was trying to lead out of Egypt a significant in, in any way. And finally, even if Moses or Pharaoh thought that Moses was going to leave Egypt and set out a kingdom somewhere, well, why would he see this as an attempt to drive him 
uh, out of Egypt. Again, it is unclear. In order to understand um, Pharaoh's claim, we have to have, um, we need knowledge, certain knowledge of, cert of some episodes in the his history of ancient Egypt. Um, those episodes happened three to four centuries before Moses' time. And all this information was unknown and on until the last one and a half centuries or so. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam could not have known any of this. The exegetes, exegetes definitely did not um, know this, which is why their explanations remained unconvincing and they found it really actually difficult uh, to come up with something that, that fully uh, kind of explains in a convincing way Pharaoh's claim, Pharaoh's perception of what Moses uh, was trying to do. So, what wh what is the the kind of the clue to solving this riddle? Uh, Egyptians, ancient uh, Egyptian uh, kind of Egyptian history, ancient Egyptian history is usually traditionally divided into dynasties. And uh, Joseph, Prophet Joseph, is believed to have lived uh, under the 15th dynasty. These were called the Hyksos. The Hyksos ruled in the Nile Delta, in the eastern part of the Nile Delta, uh, for around a century between roughly 1650 to 1550 BCE. Their capital, and you can see in the uh, image in the background image the delta at the top and um, uh, they lived uh, uh, their capital was a city called Avaris uh, the site today is known in Arabic as Tal al-Daba uh, Tal al uh, as it's pronounced usually in English and again you can see it uh, at the, the north uh, uh, in the map behind me and this is known as Lower Egypt, by the way. Uh, the Upper Sado Egypt is known as Lower Egypt. Um, now, one thing that is really critical about the Hyksos is that they were Semitic people uh, who came to Egypt from, um, from the East, uh, basically Syria, Jordan, Palestine, uh, today. They came from there uh, and they uh, occupied uh, that part of the delta and um, so they, they were not Egyptians. Uh, the name Hyksos means rulers of foreign lands and that, that kind of confirms has, how, how they were seen by the Egyptians as foreign rulers. Our knowledge, the most ancient kind of mention of the Hyksos um, and the only ancient mention of it uh, comes from uh, an account uh, by the uh, historian, um, Egyptian historian uh, Manitho, who lived about 13 centuries later after the Hyksos. Uh, Manitho's writings um, did not survive, but we have them in the form of quotes uh, from people like and uh, the Jewish, Greek Jewish, um, uh, Roman Jewish uh, historian um, Josephus, who lived in the uh, first century. According to Manitho, the Hyksos were savage people who invaded uh, the Delta from the east. They massacred people, destroyed temples, and they basically did uh, what you would ex expect uh, savage people to do. And this kind of view continued to be held uh, by scholars, uh, but uh, recently after the excavation in Egypt, uh, this is no more uh, the view uh, in uh, scholarship. Uh, scholars now, the majority of them, overwhelming majority, believe that uh, 
the, there was a kind of peaceful infiltration uh, of the Delta that from people by people from the East, uh, which started probably in the 19th uh, century BCE and continued over time. People mainly migrated, those Semitic people migrated, Asiatic people from the East, uh, West uh, Asia, uh, probably escaping famines and droughts and came to uh, to live in the Delta and, and stayed there. Uh, so this is this is kind of um, the um, the current view of how the Hyksos and others uh, ended there. Now, because of the increase increased kind of influx of these people over time, and at the same time the decline in the authority of the Egyptian pharaohs in Lower Egypt, um, and mainly in Thebes where they were based, that allowed the uh, Egyptians, uh, sorry, the Hyksos uh, to take over uh, that part of the delta and to become the main force there. In fact, uh, I mean, I mentioned that the Hyksos are uh, the, the, well, the 15th uh, dynasty, but even the 14th dynasty, the one before of, of rulers, uh, before the Hyksos, um, are uh, believed to be primarily Asiatics uh, and so came from Western Asia, and again they were based in Avaris, the same capital where the where the same city where the Hyksos turned into their capital. The Hyksos lived there for a century, and they were driven out of ultimately out of Egypt by Ahmes the first, this pharaoh, um, and that was around um, in the middle of the 16th century BCE, and. We continue, the, the, after they were driven out, you can still read about their depiction in, uh, in uh, ancient Egyptian writings, monuments, etc. as a savage people. The Egyptians really resented them, resented their rules. Um, even the, uh, in the list of kings uh, that um, uh, the Egyptians have kept, uh, the, those kings, Hyksos kings, aren't mentioned, they're not listed. And we know there were at least six Hyksos kings. They're not listed there because they were not uh, considered to be legitimate rulers of Egypt. It's completely ignored. So this is the, the kind of background information that we need to know in order to be able to understand uh, Pharaoh's strange claim. So, the Israelites, remember, whom Moses wanted uh, to lead out of Egypt, were also were Semitic people, exactly like the Hyksos. Pharaoh thought that uh, Moses was going to take them out, uh, did not simply want to take them out of Egypt to live elsewhere, and that's that. He was concerned, and he thought, that Moses was going to form some kind of alliance with other Western Asiatics and come back uh, to establish a new kingdom uh, of foreign rulers. That was the main, the reason why uh, this pharaoh uh, was very concerned uh, by uh, Moses's demand. At the time, uh, and even before then, the Egyptians, as I mentioned, has really felt, uh, found the memories of the Hyksos uh, very painful, and they just resented them. Um, and um, so uh, for anybody to come into, uh, you know, um, anybody from uh, the East, uh, in, in whatever numbers of, of, of Semite people to come into the Delta would have been very alarming uh, to, to any pharaoh. But this, this kind of possibility was even more disturbing for the pharaoh of Moses, the pharaoh that Moses confronted. Let me explain that. The pharaohs uh, used to have their capital in Thebes, which is about 800 kilometers south 
of the Delta and Thebes is in Upper Egypt. Ramses II, who is the Pharaoh uh, of Moses, moved the capital, built a new capital in a city called Piramsis, which means the house of Ramses. And that city is almost, was built almost on, this, on the same old site of Avaris, the capital of the Hyksos. More specifically, it's about two kilometers north of the Hyksos. And the, the site today is called Qantir in Arabic, Qantir. And you can see it again uh, on the map behind me, just, just north of, of Avaris. Uh, by the way, in terms of identifying the pharaoh of uh, Moses as Ramses II, uh, I uh, did um, a kind of quite detailed and long uh, discussion um, presentation uh, on Paul, Paul Williams' um, outstanding channel, YouTube channel, Blogging Theology, so those who are interested uh, can refer to it and they can kind of look into how I uh, kind of identified the Pharaoh of, uh, of Moses um, as being Ramses II. So, now, think about the kind of uh, extra risk that uh, Ramses II saw in any potential return of, the, of, of Semite people into the area. Now, the uh, uh, earlier pharaohs were actually in the south, in Thebes. The problem with Ramses, the biggest, kind of bigger problem is that his very capital was actually next to Avaris. So if these people would come back from the east, he would be in, in a huge danger. Effectively, that would put an end to his role. And that's the reason why Ramses II was particularly disturbed by the idea that of allowing basically Moses to take the Israelites out of Egypt because that led him to think, well, he's going to take them out these Israelites uh, are the same people uh, who lived under the Hyksos. Uh, they are Semitic, and there's every possibility of Moses then forming some kind of alliance with other people, other Semite people, coming back to the Delta where their ancestors lived, and that would definitely uh, spell the end to my rule, or at least cause me huge problems that I would need to sort out militarily. The Qur'an gives us another reason as well uh, why uh, Ramses II was concerned uh, by this idea that Moses would come back with um, an army, etc. Ramses II knew of Joseph. Joseph, as the Qur'an tells us, was um, given a very prominent position um, and under the rule of at least one of the Hyksos kings. And he lived in Avaris, where they had their capital, and the Israelites who joined him after he was promoted to this position must have lived as well uh, there. And of course, when the uh, Hyksos were driven out of Egypt then, in the middle of the 16th century BCE, uh, there's every, it's just logical to think that this is a, probably the time when the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians because uh, clearly they were f kind of inflicting revenge at the end of the day. These were very, one of them at least was very close uh, to, uh, to the Hyksos, was in a very prominent position and uh, they, these people were actually invited to the area by the Hyksos and by their ancestor Joseph at the time. This kind of knowledge of Joseph that um, Pharaoh and Pharaoh's court uh, had is confirmed in the Quran. The Quran tells us that uh, there is there was one Egyptian person who was a believer, but in Moses, but he hid his belief. He couldn't uh, say I believed in Moses. Tried to kind of um, speak to Pharaoh and convince him to grant Moses his wish 
and in the course of talking to him in the course of kind of that address we read in the Quran the following Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim وَلَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ يُوسُفُ مِنْ قَبْلُ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ فَمَا زِلْتُمْ فِي شَكِّ مِمَّا جَاءَكُمْ بِهِ حَتَّى إِذَا هَلَكَ قُلْتُمْ لَنْ يَبْعَثَ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ رَسُولًا كَذَلِكَ يُضِلُّ اللَّهُ مَنْ هُوَ مُسْرِفٌ مُرْتَعٌ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ Translation And Joseph had already come to you before with the clear proofs but you remained in doubt of that which he brought to you until when he died you said never will Allah send a messenger after him now obviously this believer was trying to convince Pharaoh um, to consider the that 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 Moses was talking um, the truth that he was sent by God uh, and that he needed and he was instructed through Moses uh, by God to allow the Israel to live with him but then of course um, uh, Pharaoh was just um, completely dismissed um, Moses out of hand and all that he saw in Moses just a potential danger to his rule now somebody might ask well um, so this event happened three centuries or so uh, after the um, the Hyksos after the time of Joseph um, how, how why would um, Pharaoh and his court uh, be aware of, of Joseph? This kind of, it's a long time. Um, and the answer is very simple, really. When the Hyksos uh, were driven out of Egypt by Amos the I, uh, the Egyptians did not simply kill all those Semitic people or drive them uh, out of, of the area. Uh, we know from uh, archaeology, archaeological excavations that a lot of those people just stayed there. Some of them um, were even kind of um, were assimilated into Egyptian culture. So uh, Joseph, information about knowledge of Joseph, who was Joseph, lived through through these people, um, and and that's how. Uh, Ramses the second was aware of Joseph and how that and why that believer uh, reminded uh, the Pharaoh's court of, of Joseph so in conclusion Pharaoh's strange and baffling uh, response to Moses demand to let the Israelites leave Egypt with him uh, is, 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 is kind of is a can be understood if we know certain information uh, from uh, ancient Egypt about ancient Egypt this information was not available to Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam which is why I'm arguing that this is another historical miracle in the Quran in the same way the distinction between Pharaoh and King in the Quran is a historical miracle and it is significant, it really is, that the Qur'an ignores this kind of claim. It does not exist in the Bible. In the same way the Bible is unaware of any distinction between King and Pharaoh in the stories of Moses and Joseph, it's completely ignorant uh, of this claim that Pharaoh made about Moses' demand. The assumption that Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam copied from the Bible is nonsensical when you have this kind of information. It makes no sense. And why would Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam introduce into the Quran a claim that is actually difficult to understand in his time and can you continue to be baffling even to exegetes for centuries afterwards it just makes no sense uh, finally uh, I should mention that uh, I first discussed this historical miracle exactly a quarter of a century ago even though it remains little known at the time we wrote a book called um, with my wife Dr. Shada Adel Ghazali uh, called history testifies to the infallibility of the Quran we rewrote uh, the book 10 
um, 10 years later, uh, just improved the presentation. Uh, and uh, we released it under the title, The Mystery of Israel in Ancient Egypt. The book was also translated into Arabic uh, under the title, at tariq Yashadu Bi Asmat Al-Quran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.